I'm Tom Leonard. I'm the host of the Gamers Change Lives podcast. And I was really fortunate that Catherine Dork, who's the, tip, or who's the regular host here, uh, invited me to host today to talk about some things that, uh, that, that I've learned in esports over the past few months. So I really appreciate Catherine inviting us. Uh, and I was able to um, bring along Reginald Nasawa, who is the producer of the podcast. And again, the podcast is Gamers Change Lives. And what we talk about is how esports can create jobs all around the world. Our tagline is play games, create jobs, change lives. Welcome, Reginald. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, happy to be here for the second time. And I'm always a pretty big fan of the show, and I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So where are you speaking to us from? Okay, so... Uh, the last time I was on, I was in another city called Takaradi, but now I'm in the capital of Ghana. That is Accra. So I'm speaking um, from Accra in Ghana, and it's about 10 p.m. here, local time. Great. Great. No, appreciate you taking taking a little bit of time out of your schedule. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, because I don't want to talk about just, just the podcast, but more about the kinds of stories that we've heard on the podcast, especially the esports stories. But first, just talking about podcasting, can you describe, Rachel, because you have your own podcast outside of the Great Gamers Change Lives. Can you talk about why podcasting is so powerful and getting a message out there? Yeah, I think um, podcasting is an amazing opportunity that ha that technology has provided the world over. I mean, I, I remember I have a radio background um, after, after university. Uh, I got a, a small job at a radio station where I was a sports journalist and I could think about how difficult it is for people to tell their stories, you know, unless they have, have such opportunities. But with podcasting, you are able to um, tell your story, you know, quite easily, get very, very good engagement about it. And it provides the opportunity to hear amazing stories from all over the world. And because of technology, I mean, We've spoken to people from different parts of the world. So I think that podcasting is a great way to to get the message heard. I think those times with radio, if you miss the, the time of the program, that is it. But podcasting, you can play it back, you can slow it down, you can accelerate, you can... And it's, I think it's content for generations to come. So I really love podcasting. And yeah, I think it's, it's a great... Um, it's just a great platform to be heard. Is is podcasting popular in Africa? Yeah, it is growing. It is growing. Um, I'm fortunate to be on the uh, uh, the African Podcasters Network, and we see our numbers growing a lot. Because I mean, Africa is known for storytelling. I mean, every child can tell you about maybe twenty, if I'm not exaggerating, stories because. You know, animals from the animal kingdom, things like plants. The parents teach you true stories. Uh, that you know, we have the by fire and uh, by the fire side, where you are, where the elders communicate life lessons through story. So I think it's something that is it, it is growing. The only thing about podcasting that hasn't yet evolved here in Africa is how to monetize. You know, giving creators the opportunities to monetize because most of the monetizations are not available in this part of the world. But I think that it is gradually growing. The number of, you know, creators are growing every time. Every time people are asking, how do I get into podcasting? How can I start my own podcast? So it is something that is really, really taking shape and gaining momentum um, across Africa. So one of the things that's always so important is to be able to find good guests for a podcast. And one of the things in starting our podcast here, it was like, okay, how do you get guests for your podcast if you have no episodes to show them and you were so good at finding us those guests from the very beginning if it wasn't for you we wouldn't have a show because we wouldn't have had the guests out there so what would you tell people how do you get guests for a podcast yeah well i think getting guests for a podcast is as easy as just asking them and being patient and not being afraid of a no i think sometimes um it's the judgment we have in our heads that stops us from doing great things. And for me, I think what really 
took off for me was that I, I was um, fortunate to be selected as a Mandela Washington Fellow by the State Department. And when I came to the U.S., I, you know, it just dawned on me that uh, people really want to help. People are accessible. You know, um, uh, people are also looking for opportunities for them to be, you know, to to be known. And people just want to support every great course. So I think if you are having a podcast, your message is good for people, it's good for your community, it's good for the world. I think a lot of people will want to join you in that vision. So I think that getting guests is very easy. You need to reset for the guests. And you always don't start small. Go for the biggest guests. No, no, no. I mean, not per se, but I mean, go for people that, you know, really have good stories to tell. So don't be shy. Just reach out. Um, thank God for platforms like LinkedIn. And I think, you know, for me, that's also improved on my relationship and my networking. So I think it's a different form of networking, but I love doing it. Even the people who don't respond, because I think that the worst is to, uh, for someone to say no. Or I'm not available at this time, but you always have with about um, 10 people that I reach out to, at least seven do offer a good response. So I think it's a good number. And yeah, so it's not that difficult. I, I think two of the things that you said there, I think are really important. One is just to ask. I mean, if you don't ask, you yes. don't get it. That's the life in general. But also don't be afraid of the nose. It's like, there, there are so many people out there to talk to that if those people say no, for whatever reason, the other thing that we found with the podcast is there might be a no right now, but then later on they yeah. come back and they, they, they're they yeah. asking to be on the podcast, which is a great situation to be on. So let's talk a little bit about esports because that's the theme of the show here, the wide world of esports. And one of the things that I think is really interesting here is that neither one of us are big gamers in that, you know, we're, we're not out there on Fortnite or on Call of Duty or Mortal Kombat or, or whatever, but we have a podcast that talks about esports. And one of the things that I think we've developed is the audience for our podcast is not huge, but it's really passionate. And it's mainly made up of esports entrepreneurs, not bad gamers, not the people that are out there playing the age. We're, we don't talk about how, be, how to become a better player, but we talk about how to build a business. What are some of the common themes? that you have found in all the, uh, we have 56, I, I counted 56 episodes so far in 18 months, uh, which we should be really proud of. So, uh, but what are some of the common themes that you've noticed? Yeah, I think that, um, first of all, I've noticed a great lot of passion with all the entrepreneurs that we've spoken to, because we've, we've had a lot of them that are coming from um, very, very, um, challenging backgrounds with a lot of limitations, especially going into a field like esports, where people feel that in some of those places, the culture doesn't really see how there's a path from esports into, let's say, getting the job. It's not something that's traditional. Even some of, you know, people think that the, there's, there's nothing like that. It's just people wasting their time on TV, um, you know, on their consoles playing video games. So one of the things that I've seen that from the stories that I've seen that um, it's like a fire that cannot be quenched and the people that we, we, we interview find different ways to make their dream work. And I think with the differences in, 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 in strategy or tactics or how to do it, but I think the core thing is that, you know, they are really passionate about it. And then one of the other things that we also see is collaboration. We see that the, the, in the esports industry, collaboration, most of the the entrepreneurs do not work, work in isolation. So we've had a lot of guests who know other guests, who know other guests, who they say, oh, I've, I've been in a panel with him. We've attended a conference together. So I see a lot of unity in that. And I think it's a similar for esports because some of them are team owners who normally compete for the same prizes and the same competition. But for the good of the industry, you could see that kind of, you know, collaboration that is coming in that I think you, you, you might not see in other industries. And what I think I'm also seeing is that I'm seeing a lot of people who are thinking not only for themselves, but they are in for their community. So some of the esports entrepreneurs are addressing social challenges with the, the esports. Some of them who are, are addressing um, women's rights. You know, we had Amela from Sri Lanka who is again using 
the the the, the fabric industry and linking it to esports. So that is great. So it's like they are, they are, they are looking at what is available to them, what their limitations are, and they are innovating around it to to and it's all together with the esports. So I really love them about it, and a lot of them is the commitment and dedication. Some of them have not even made too much profit from the business side, but they are pushing and then they are celebrating their small wins and then they are moving forward. So it, it, it's, it's been great seeing a lot of, I, I like um, triumphant stories and, and, and overcoming stories. So when we see how, you know, these entrepreneurs have been able to overcome limitations, some struggle with sponsorship, some of them really hit hard times, but they were able to ride a storm and then move to the next level. So it's, it's, there's a lot of resilience and a lot of, um, you know, lessons to be learned from people who are actually, you know, having um, uh, uh, a road or a path through, through, through rocks. Yeah, if I, if I would say. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm probably going to repeat some of the things, but on my little list here was that we talked to a lot of people that saw a need and then went to fill it. It's like they didn't say, oh, someone needs to go do this. They're like, I'm going to go do this. Like John Cash, creating jobs, at, creating a program at HBCUs. Sagar Nair in India, creating programs there. Ronnie Lusigi. And it probably the, the, the most ultimate one is Gerald Solomon creating uh, NASAP because and at the nonprofit, they saw that there was a need. The, another thing was that um, if you just, uh, people need to explain esports to their parents. And I'll always remember the story yeah. of uh, two stories. Uh, Romain uh, Tixier in France. I hope I didn't butcher his name. Um, I, I still remember him saying, he still remembers being in the basement, his dad coming down saying, get out of the basement and go get a job. You're just playing this game. And so he went out and got an esports job. So, and then Jada Solo in um, Nigeria, whose son was making, made an Instagram video to explain to her what esports is. It's like, how perfect is that? The other thing, the other um, theme that I, we keep hearing is that we, there's more work that needs to be done on making women part of the industry. We talked to Chantal and Miao in, uh, in Asia, uh, yeah, women in games in, in Asia. And yeah, we talked to, um, Inca in Germany and so on. And Shirley in Puerto Rico. And they all were talking about how, you know, there's a lot of people understand that there needs to be more women involved at all different levels. But there's just probably not as many programs out there. So, um, so those are the kinds of themes that that I think we're starting to, to hear. I mean, a lot of different themes over fifty six. What are some of the most memorable stories from the podcast? Not and one of the great things here we can't say what, who's your favorite guest because that's like who's your favorite kid. But it's like um, from what are some of the more memorable stories that come to mind? Well, I think. Um, uh, Speaking to uh, Finn Aru, you know, um, and in Kenya, how from, I mean, just by playing video games with his brother, and how he was, she was able to now grow into that, um, and and then actually, in, in the more male dominated side, which is fighting games, which I think that sometimes the competition can get very very brutal, and you know she. She, uh, she even says sometimes she has to even, you know, um, sometimes they will try to pull her hair and all that and how she was able to, to start from such age. And then she's a, she's a law student, someone who is um, studying to read law, but she's very, very passionate and she was able to get a, a, um, a professional contract in esports. So I think that was... Um, that was quite amazing, uh, you know, for me, that, and it showed how passionate she, you know, she was and, and that there are no limits and, and things can also happen. And one of the other stories too is how the team from Ghana went to Bali, oh. you know, and <laughs> it was a life changing experience for me. Explain, explain, you know, explain the, a little bit, <laughs> explain a little bit more about that episode. Cause that was on my list too. It's one of my favorite uh, conversations. Can you explain what, what the deal was and why it was such a big deal? Yeah, I mean, it was a big deal because some of the parents did not believe it. <laughs> so, so, so I think it's it's something that made a, a difference because playing games, you know, 
when you come here in Ghana, all the East Port centers are wooden kiosks by the street corner somewhere with some, you know, electrical connection with old TV sets where they connect the consoles. So from that age to where you are able to get to an international competition, that is amazing. And, and you know, getting people to, to you know, to follow and love. And also when we, we, we interviewed Gerald, he was like, hey, Percy uh, Hayford was the team leader from Ghana, attended almost all the, you know, all the classes, trying to learn as many things as possible. I think one of the other stories too that impressed me was Ronnie Lusigi, uh, uh, you know, from Kenya, how he used um, an, an Olympic athlete to mentor, you know, um, the uh, esports players and how he was able to use the power of the media to get the attention of his, 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 his sports federation to support his esports efforts and how he was able to, you know, position his, his you know, his esports and then start making publicity about the esports effort. So that, that really showed a lot of, um, uh, you know, creativity and innovation and determination to be able to, to achieve that because they know that they are underdog, but they will not accept, you know, you know, being kept to they'll, they'll, you know, they want to rise to the top. They want to do well. So there have been so, so many, uh, great and amazing stories from all the people that we've, you know, we've been talking to. Yeah. yeah you, you know, I completely agree that now the, the story of Kwesi going to Bali, Kwesi and the team from Ghana, I mean, I'm just thinking like, what, what about a team from the U.S. going to Bali? What a big deal that would be for that team. But think if you're going from Ghana, all the, all the challenges that would show up to make that happen. I think uh, one, of the, one of the other stories that kept coming up was um, how important the international organizations are. And with the kinds of things that they do for, um, for, for, for teams all over the world. I mean, the reason that they went to Bali was because the um, IESF created the, the opportunity for them to go there. And so I think that sometimes pe uh, people don't give them enough credit for doing things that help uh, everyone out there. We also talked to um, uh, another team that we talked to was Control in, um, yeah. in Britain with Nick Turner and to hear, hear the stories, those guys, because we talked to a lot of education people this year, as, uh, for some reason. And one of the things though, is that they were talking about going from, um, going to school and then going and getting a job, which of course is a, I mean, that's a, that's a thing everyone goes through that goes to college is, Hey, now, now you get, Oh, now I got to get a job. And just talking about how they were using their esports training to help them. And what about, um, um, Oh man, I can't remember the guy from um, from West Point. What what was his name? Yeah, that was Victor Castro. Victor Castro, and, and just using esports as a way. Sorry, Victor, just to, using esports as a way to um, teach leadership at West Point. It's like yeah, these people are are super creative. I also liked when we brought in a couple of um, what I call divergent voices. When we had Jeremy Utley talking about idea flow, it's like he's not a gamer. It's like, you know, he's at Stanford, and, but he had some really interesting stories that everyone could, um, could relate to. And we have Matt Abrahams coming up soon, who's a communications um, uh, instructor there at the Graduate School of Business there at Stanford to talk about communication. So we, we can just be telling all kinds of, of different stories. So are there any surprises that, that you didn't expect at the beginning? Yeah, about the podcast or... Yeah, yeah, the podcast. Bro. I mean, when we when we when we started this podcast eighteen months ago, it was like I had the idea. Oh, this could be an interesting podcast, an interesting topic. I didn't see anyone else doing it because what we wanted to do was to talk to tell the stories of other people. It's like we didn't want to tell the stories of how does someone in California tell you how to do it. It's like no, we wanted to tell the stories of people all over the world so that the audience could see themselves uh, in in the um, uh, the guests that showed up. So we started out like 18 months ago. We had three seasons. We had first season, we talked about jobs. Second season, we talked called follow the money. We talked about investment. We talked about um, sponsorship. And the last one we called eSports 101, which we're just finishing up 
now and talking to a lot of different people, but over the whole journey of the entire podcast, would you, what, what are some of the surprises, things that going in, you just, you didn't, you know, that you didn't expect to, uh, to see? Well, um, for me, I think it's how esports is sort of like a universal language. And one of the things that I, I, I saw was that if you talk to people from Africa, from uh, Asia, from Eastern Europe, it's sort of, it's the same thing. There's a lot of repetition in the challenges they are facing and how tr easily transferable the skills, you know, are from one place to another. So I think that came as a surprise to me. And one other thing was how, you know, the different um, facet of esports, because when you look at esports, you're thinking maybe it's just the gamers, consoles. By getting into it, I've learned a lot about the different, different aspects. Like there are so many different areas and of, of, of career growth and opportunity that are in, you know, that are involved in esports. I mean, you know, uh, if you have team psychologists, then <laughs> you can look at it like a sport itself. We have Amela talking to us about things that have to do with health and the comfort of, of, of gamers. And then we had uh, Hendrik doing some. So there's a lot of innovation coming out of, you know, that whole, uh, uh, you know, esports industry. And it was, it's, it's amazing. And I think one of the things too is that the esports e people are really nice people. That was one of the things that, you know, that, that, well, that was one of the things well, that, that came out. Yes. It, yeah. Yeah. And along the same theme, it's just like, I was continually impressed how generous people were. And you, and you, you hit on it earlier. It's like, these are people who are com competing against each other in a lot of cases. But when it comes to helping each other out, I mean, almost everyone that we talked to, that, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to help themselves, but they wanted to help other people as well. And I mean, who's, who is more of a giver than, um, than Amir, Amir Safat, who created on LinkedIn this, this he saw, again, um, his, his conversation was more about gaming than esports, but he saw that all these people were losing their jobs last year. In uh, the gaming industry, and he thought, yeah, geez, someone should do something. So he created his own database of jobs, so that people. Yeah. And I forget his numbers, but uh, but he he through through his um, his database there, a lot of people found jobs. He wasn't in it because he he didn't make any money off of all that. Yeah, but he was just like he was just like a giver, and we just over and over again, we kept coming across people who were who were doing things not for themselves but to help others. Yeah. yeah that was the amazing. Industry. I mean, yep. the, for, for Amir, it, it was not just about the jobs. He had mentors, people who are reviewing people's resumes, people who are checking, uh, uh, you know, people's cover letters. He actually created a whole new directory for, and it was, it, it's open. I mean, people with access to such groups would have charged membership fee or, or something like that. But that, that was amazing. For me, I think that was really, really amazing. So, yeah. So those were some of the the great stories, you know, that uh, uh, came out from the podcast. And yeah. One of the other things that you, you mentioned, you touched on there was, was just the, the different kinds of jobs out there. I mean, because when you talk to you that you, for a team, and there's all those, the jobs that, I mean, most people, when they think of um, esports, gaming, they're thinking of the player, they're thinking of the streamers, yeah. and that's the that you that's the job. If you're going to be in esports, you got to be a really good player. And that's yeah. not, not not true. There's many more jobs that have nothing. There's accountants, or my favorite one of all was Andy Oladun was talking about drone operator. At their, I mean, yeah, you could be a drone operator and get a job in esports. So we kept hearing that story over and over again which I thought was, uh, it was just amazing. What, 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 what's the most interesting job you heard of? Well, for me, I think it will be the legal side of esports. <laughs> yeah, I think we've had some, some pretty, uh, uh, two legal people talking to us about esports and even the idea of someone, you know, who could come to the United States as a special talent, someone with a special talent, and it can be esports. 
And that for me, it's amazing. So I think that the legal side, contract, tournament money, there's a whole lot of things that go into it. So I think for me, the legal side really stood out for me in 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 esports that it is not just about games that people got yeah. in, but the, the, yeah, there's a legal side to it. Who knew that, that even existed? Hey, as we wrap up here, so what's next on the podcast for the podcast? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty ex- excited about what next because we are uh, starting some LinkedIn lives because LinkedIn has become the platform for for us uh, looking at our audience, targeting people in business, in sponsorship, esports entrepreneurs, and the organizations. So we want to, um, you know, we will be starting the first one we'll talk about the growth of esports in Africa because over the past um, several months to a year. Uh, esports in Africa has seen massive growth and investment. We have our first service <laughs> in West Africa. You know, it happened this year. We had, you know, um, teams and players from Africa um, competing in tournaments around the world. And yeah, so so we want to start like that and yeah, get more engagement and then get more of our listeners to to participate live on these LinkedIn uh, live. So. I think uh, everyone should look out for them coming out soon. And uh, we hope that you participate in that. It will be exciting. Really, really exciting. Yeah, that's a good, good point. That, yeah, one of the one things you don't get with the podcast is you don't get live interaction back and forth. You, you don't hear people ask questions. They can interact with the social media afterwards, but that's uh, always just just not the same. So, yeah, so the LinkedIn Lives are coming up. That's That's going to be really good because... There's so many things to talk about worldwide. We could talk about, I mean, one of the things that surprised me was how everything's mobile around the world. I mean, here, if you're in the U.S., you don't think, you don't think of mobile first. But so many people we talk to, so that could be another LinkedIn Live. So there's just, you know, a lot of different, um, a different um, topics out there. But, but I really like the idea of, of talking about Africa, in particular with servers. It's like we've, we've heard about servers from day one, I, I'm sure. Day, day one. And again, that's the kind of thing that we wouldn't necessarily think. So, hey, we're winding down here. Thanks, Reginald, for taking a little bit of time. This has been this has been fun these last 18 months. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, I'm excited to see what is coming up next. Thank you for inviting me to the show. Great. Okay. This is Tom Leonard. I'm the creator and host of the Gamers Change Lives podcast.